Hello everyone, in this video I will be breaking down James Tinian IV's horror book called The Nice House on the Lake. I will be covering volume 1, which covers issues 1 through 6. I believe this is a 12 issue miniseries, so it will hopefully finish as of issue 12. And right now, they are currently up to issue 10, so I may return to this later and finish off the story. Now, the concept of this book is so unique, okay? It is about these group of friends that are invited to this nice house on the lake. And at first, everything is normal and going fine. But then they learn that it is the end of the world. Everybody else in the world is dead. It is like the apocalypse. They are burning. Everyone is gone except for them. And they have to live forever there on that nice house on the lake. And there's lots of mystery abound. So I was immediately into this book when I read through it. I thought it was so compelling. I wanted to know the mystery. Uh, yeah, so I'm really high on this book. Let's dive into it now. Volume one of The Nice House on the Lake. The Nice House on the Lake, volume one, written by James Tinian IV, art by Alvaro Martinez Bueno, and colors by Jordi Belair. Issue 1 There is a man named Walter. He is bisexual. Interesting fact, James Tinian IV is also bisexual in real life, so I think Walter is in some ways a way to mirror a little bit of himself into the book. But yes, Walter, he is an ordinary man. He grew up. He went to high school. He made friends. He went to college. He made some more friends. And then he moved to New York City and yet again made some more friends there. These are some of Walter's friends, the people he cares about the most. There is Sam Nguyen, the reporter. Sam met Walter in high school. Sam is in a romantic relationship with Arturo Perez, the acupuncturist. Walter is friends with the both of them. There is Molly Reynolds, the accountant. When Walter was in high school, he met Molly at their local mall. There is Veronica Wright, the scientist. She was best friends with Molly. There is Nora Jacobs, the writer, who used to go by Norm back then. Nora, or Norm, is another high school friend of Walter's. When Nora was Norm back in high school, Norm dated Veronica for quite a bit. There is Rick McEwen, the pianist, whom Walter met at a dining hall when they were in college. So now we are meeting some of his college friends. There is Nea Radia, the doctor. She is now married to Rick. There is David Day, the comedian whom Walter first met at a party back in college. There is Ryan Kane, the artist. Walter met her because she used to date David Day, the comedian. There is Sarah Radnitz, the consultant, whom Walter met smoking outside of a dormitory in college. Walter and these ten friends are the main characters in this book. Who they are and what their little role is is going to be very important for the story. Some of Walter's friend group from high school and college and his adult life in New York overlapped with one another. Some of them knew each other and some of them didn't fall in the same friend circle. But either way, Walter, now in his early 30s in the year 2021, he decided he wanted to have all of his friends come together and spend a week at his lake house in Wisconsin in the summer. Even though everyone didn't exactly know each other, he thought everyone would have fun, and Walter promised a great time. In early February of that year, he sent an email to his many friends talking about this trip. He wrote, Hello all you beautiful monsters. It's been a busy, busy few years, and we've all spread ourselves thin around the country and abroad. It's not as easy to meet up for a drink as it used to be. Even those of you I still live in the city with rarely get to see me especially given the state of the world. I miss you all terribly, and that's something I'd like to remedy. A few days ago, a friend of my mom's said that I could borrow his lake house in upstate Wisconsin for a week this summer, June 14th to the 20th. 
I've attached a few pictures and I would attach more, but they're honestly too beautiful and I think you'd all be convinced I'd made the whole thing up. But I promise you, it's real. This is important to me. This is why I've been texting you all mysteriously about your summer schedule and plans, so no pretending you have something better to do. If you need help with travel, let me know. If you need to be strong-armed into coming, let me know and I'll unleash my very strong arms. I'll send a more detailed itinerary as we get closer. Walter. So Walter was talking to all of his friends and he sent that email and if any friends needed more persuading to come, Walter would try and persuade them. Walter, he also wanted to keep the guest list a little bit mysterious. He wrote his one friend Ryan, who's a female, in May. He wrote to Ryan saying, Ryan, I'm so very glad you agreed to come to the house this summer. It's been more difficult to nail everyone down than I expected. The house was meant to have room for 15, but we're down to 12 coming for the week. Disappointing, but I think the others will be more disappointed in the long run. Attached to this email, you'll find all the information you need to get to the house from the airport, which is simple enough. A driver will be waiting for you when you get off your flight. You'll also find a few helpful maps of the house and the grounds. I've created little name placards for everyone that will be placed around the house. I did it because I think it's fun, and also because these documents talk about the others attending, and I wanted to keep the final guest list a little mysterious. This was more a concern with my other friends, to keep them from asking around and looping in people who weren't invited. You are the artist. Over the course of your visit, you might find a few little treats labeled with your symbol that I know you will appreciate. Most importantly, you'll find your symbol on your bedroom. You'll be sharing a room with the writer, who I promise you know and like. Please text if you have any questions or concerns, but I really couldn't be happier that you're going to make it. It wouldn't be the same without you, Walter. Alright everyone, that's kind of our setup. All of these different friends have been brought to this lake house by Walter. It's a little quirky that Walter has designated his friends certain titles based on their job or skill, and he put their little symbols on their bedroom door, but it still sounds like a pretty fun time and a free trip. The day finally comes, June 14th, and all ten of Walter's friends fly from across the country, and they all eventually arrive at... The Nice House on the Lake! Let's see our guest's journey now. First, we are following Ryan Kane, the artist. She is 26 years old. She arrives and meet Nora Jacobs, the writer, Walter's friend from high school. They exchange hellos. The two of them then walk inside the house. Inside the house, it is beautiful. It is like a Hollywood mansion in there. It is like a place that rich assholes would live. Inside the house, they see David Day, the comedian. He is Walter's friend from college. David, he's already drinking. David tells Nora and Ryan, Hey, I was looking for a TV, and I found a frickin' movie theater downstairs. And the seats are all heated with built-in massagers. David, he hugs Ryan as he knows her from New York. He grabs Ryan away, and he wants to show her more of the house. We see Molly Reynolds, the accountant, and Veronica Wright, the scientist. Both of them are high school friends of Walter, and they are also checking the place out. They comment on how nice it is, and how they want to go take the kayaks out later this week. Veronica, the scientist, says that there is a telescope here. She's excited to check out the stars here. Veronica sees Nora downstairs. She used to date Nora back in high school when Nora was a man named Norm. Veronica says hello to her, and Nora says, hey, back. Sam Nguyen, the reporter, an old high school friend of Walter's, has arrived with his boyfriend, Arturo Perez, the acupuncturist. They are on the rooftop patio of the lake house, overlooking the lake. It is, of course, a beautiful view. Eventually, Sam and Arturo meet Ryan and Nora, and 
David, and they all get acquainted and say their hellos. There is Sarah Radnitz, the consultant. She brought her laptop. Even though she is on vacation, she is still trying to do some work. Her job is connected to the government. Ryan Kane, she is admiring the scenery when Naya Radia, the doctor, comes over and says hi. They know each other from New York as well. Naya's boyfriend, or perhaps husband, Rick McEwen, the pianist, is nearby toweling off. He also says hello. As everyone is saying hi and getting acquainted, finally Walter, the man of honor, arrives. Walter announces to the group, I'm glad you all came. Now who wants to test these steaks out on the grill? So they all eat some steaks, and they drink, and they talk, and they're hanging out by the pool. Everyone's having a pretty fun time. Eventually though, Ryan, she looks at her phone. Reception has been pretty spotty here at the nice house on the lake for most people, but Ryan's cell phone provider seems to have better reception, so she has some signal. Ryan, she's looking at her phone, and she's scrolling through Twitter, and she sees that something bad has happened in New York City. Not only in New York, all over the world. People are burning to death spontaneously. Their skin is falling off, their eyes are melting in their sockets. People are dying and nobody knows why and the sky is on fire. It looks like Armageddon, the end of the world. Ryan, she turns to the group who are all laid back and enjoying themselves and she yells, there's, there's something wrong. Everyone shut the fuck up. There's something wrong. New York City is gone. There are pictures of people burning alive all over Twitter and Instagram. Oh shit, I'm gonna throw up. The entire party in fun mood grinds to a halt. They all move to the TV, and when they turn on the TV, they see the emergency broadcast system message is on. Everyone is panicking. They start thinking of their loved ones back home. Ryan then, she remembers a conversation she had with Walter when they first met years ago. Walter asked her, how do you think the world will end? It was an odd, nihilistic question, but Ryan was intrigued by Walter, and her and Walter actually discussed it for a bit. Kind of like a silly, joke conversation you might have about that topic. Ryan, she gave some theories, and she asked Walter what his theories were. She said, what do you think? How do you think the world will end? Walter answered, I don't know. I'm still trying to decide, but it helps to talk about it, I think. We should continue this conversation sometime. And they did continue talking about it. Ryan has that memory on her mind now, though, and she realizes that this whole lake house wasn't a coincidence. Walter brought them all here. She says out loud and points at Walter and says, You picked. You picked us. Just tell them. Don't pretend. Walter, he then admits to the group, I'm sorry, everyone. You can't leave. There's nowhere for you to leave to. No world to go back to. Not in any way that matters. This house, this lake, the beautiful woods around us, this is what's left. The seven billion people out there are dead, or they will be dead shortly. This is why I brought you here. I wanted to save you from what my people were going to do to your planet. I'm not going to explain to you what I really am, or why this was necessary. I'd rather you all think of me as the man you always knew me to be, your friend. That's why I arranged this, a corner of the world preserved for you to live out the rest of your lives in peace. You won't want for anything here. You have delicious food, alcohol, kayaks, boats, entertainment. You have this incredible house I built just for you and you have each other. But you will never be able to leave. Put the horrors away. Open another beer. Put on the music. Relax. Nothing out there matters to you anymore. You are okay. You are all going to be okay. Nora is not accepting this. What? She grabs a poker that you would use in the fireplace, and she swings at Walter's face with it. And Walter's face appears to get all messed up. But he doesn't die, and it is clear that Walter, in fact, is not human. 
His face just gets all stretched out and weird looking and stuff. But he is fine. Somehow, Walter retaliates and with his brain makes Nora's wrist kind of explode and break. And Nora screams out in pain. Walter tells the group, I know you're all hurting, but in time you'll see this was the right call. I'll be back every now and then to toast to the old world. Until then, I hope you find it in you to enjoy yourselves. I love you all. Walter, he then disappears, and the entire group are all stunned. Issue 2 Rick McEwen, the pianist, has a memory of him and Walter in college in their dorm room together. Walter was sad then, and he told Rick, Do you think anybody likes me? And Rick asked Walter, What's wrong? And Walter answered, It's just a lot. There's only a little time left, and I'm not ready. Rick replied, You mean with school? Graduation is still like a whole semester away. Walter replied, Yeah, school. In retrospect, Walter was probably talking about the end of the world which he knew was coming. Rick told Walter that he loves him, and so do the rest of Walter's friends like Sarah and David and all of Walter's old high school buddies. Walter told Rick, Yeah, yeah, I know. Just don't hate me, okay? No matter what, even if everybody else does, please, don't hate me. Back to the current day now at the nice house on the lake. Mysteriously, we see a transcript of what happened next after the end of last issue. Who and how this transcript was written and why was it written is unknown. Is this merely a way the comic wants to tell us the story or is there something more to this? Is someone reading these transcripts in the comic? Maybe we'll find out later, maybe we won't. From the transcript, we pick up when Nora's arm broke and Walter disappeared. The others were all frantic, commenting, What the F was that? How the F did he do that? He just blew up Nora's arm with his brain and then he disappeared. Is this all some sort of joke? This isn't real. Eventually, Naya Radia, the doctor, came to Nora's aid and help patch her up. Well, that was night one at the nice house on the lake. Now we go to day two. Rick McEwen, the pianist. He wakes up in bed by his girlfriend, Naya Radia, the doctor, by his side. They talk. Naya says that Nora is doing better. Rick goes to take a shower. After he showers, he admires the view out the window. You can't deny it is a beautiful view. Walter just appears in the bathroom there beside Rick. Walter tells Rick, Hi Rick, I'm sorry. This isn't how I wanted the week to go. But if this is going to work, I'm going to need your help. We then see a recording and transcript of various conversations going on downstairs. It's mostly just everyone confused by all the end of the world stuff they were seeing on their phones and whatnot. They read a Washington Post headline saying it was a coordinated global attack and the President of the United States is dead? And one hour and 15 minutes ago, Twitter just stopped as did all news silence across the board. We then see an agenda that Walter made for everyone in the beginning of the week and what he planned for each day. So day one, everyone arrives and then stakes on the grill. And for the night crowd, a monster movie. But you know, then the world ended and the rest of the itinerary people don't really want to do anymore. But let's see what Walter planned for anyway. On day two, there was going to be a lazy morning breakfast, and then a house meeting, and the week's grocery list. And then they were going to take out the boats, and then relax, and then a family dinner. And for the night crowd, a thriller Tuesday. And then on Wednesday, another lazy morning breakfast, and then relax, lunch, afternoon hike, relax, family dinner. For the night crowd, whiskey western Wednesday, etc, 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 for the rest of the week. Ryan Kane, the artist, is downstairs, talking to Molly, the accountant, and Veronica, the scientist. Ryan is trying to figure out how Walter knows everyone. Maybe it will help her figure things out if she can make sense of all the connections. 
Naya, Rick, Sarah, and David are in the kitchen. They are all eating food. Sarah comments that this bagel is really, really good. David comments, yeah, Walter said he brought a big bag from a bagel smith in Brooklyn. The rest in the kitchen pause and look at David a little weird. And David adds, what? Am I supposed to pretend that Walter didn't say things now? He did. This is before he blew up the world and went all flesh tornado, okay? Sarah wonders, are these the last fresh bagels they will ever eat in their lifetime? They discuss, should they be preserving food? Will they all starve soon? Sarah leaves to go take a smoke. Sarah finds Nora out there, and the two of them smoke some cigarettes. Sarah comments, Please tell me you brought like a suitcase full of cigarettes? At this rate, I'm going through my entire pack day one in purgatory here. Nora theorizes that, I bet as soon as we finish this pack, a new pack will just magically turn up for us in the house. Sarah says that maybe they should go explore the house. Maybe see if they can find this secret stash of cigarettes that Walter left for them. In the house, Sam Nguyen, the reporter, announces, Everyone listen up! I found something that everybody needs to see. It's just outside. A group of them follow Sam. Rick and Naya hold back though. Rick wants to talk to Naya in private. Elsewhere in the house, Nora and Sarah are exploring. They find a spa room with a sensory deprivation tank. They also check out the movie theater room. Then they go to the library. Nora comments, look at these books. There are shelves of how-to books, stuff on building and repairs and boat maintenance. Nora is shocked, and then she says, look, look at this whole bookshelf. It's just books and comics that Walter told me to read going back to when we were teenagers. They then find a little key at the back of one of the bookshelves. Where will it lead to? All right, so Nora and Sarah are exploring the house. They are in the library. Rick and Naya, they are talking privately. And Sam, he is leading the rest of the group to a weird looking statue outside. Sam explains that he was walking around last night he was walking around the invisible wall that seems to circle the lake and property. And as he was walking around, he eventually came across this statue with a sad looking face on it. And Sam says that he touched it and the statue showed him his home. What's left of it anyway. Ryan Kane, she touches the statue and she sees her home. She sees New York City burning and people dying and she backs away from the statue, scared. We jump over to Rick, talking to his girlfriend, Naya. Rick is influenced by Walter visiting him in the bathroom earlier. Rick tells Naya, What if we take all of this at face value? We are the only people left in the world. Walter isn't human, and he put us here because he loved us. Everyone is going to lose their minds trying to get away from the house. But I think we need to accept that the house is all we got. Somebody here needs to be the voice of reason. Walter's itinerary? I think it still makes sense. People are going to reject it because they're afraid of him now, but he wrote it for a reason. At the very least, we should have dinner together as a group every night. A little structure will keep us all from going insane. Naya asks, and what if the others don't let us make the most of it, Rick? Rick answers, Then honestly, I bet Walter has a plan for that, too. Elsewhere in the house, back over to Nora and Sarah exploring. They found that weird key in the library, and they opened it, and it led to a secret passageway. And in that secret passage, they find some guns and weapons and explosives. What are these for, they wonder. Back over to Rick and Naya. Naya hugs Rick and agrees to help him with the plan of calming everybody down and making them feel that this is normal. Issue 3 We see a text exchange between Sam and Walter from before the nice house on the lake vacation. Sam was trying to tell Walter that he couldn't come. 
But Walter convinced him, told Sam that he could work from the cabin, told him that he needed to take a real vacation. He told him, I miss you, man. I miss everybody. I want the people I care most about to be there, and that includes you. I won't push you much harder, but who knows when we'll all get another chance to do something like this. So Sam took some convincing, but he came to the current day now, day four. Sam Nguyen, the reporter, is with his partner Arturo, and they are in bed. Sam is just staring out into space. Arturo asks Sam if he's okay. Sam just answers, no. Downstairs in the kitchen, Rick, Naya, and David are talking. Naya says that they should watch something nice tonight, a movie. David says, we got a whole movie theater and like every movie you have ever heard of. We don't need to watch a Disney movie, Naya. Naya says, hey, I didn't say it had to be a Disney movie. I just said it should be something nice. No horror, no death, something feel good, maybe a comedy? Rick states, I think it's a great idea. Rick and Naya are trying to get people to start doing normal things, accept things. Sam, though, he comes downstairs. He says that he wants to survey the area today and get a sense of how big a space they're in and also take some inventory on various items they have and food. Sam soon learns, though, that Rick and Naya are trying to plan people's day. Rick says he wants to take one of the boats out and grab some beers and snacks and enjoy the open lake. Not do anything serious today. Sam is flabbergasted. He says, are you kidding me? Rick makes his argument. We're all scared, Sam. We're all scared, but we're not helping anyone by letting it consume us. I think getting a sense of space and doing an inventory are both great, great ideas. And we should do them, but what if we get started on that tomorrow? What if we do like one day on and one day off? Sam is starting to get really angry. He says, you want to drink beers on a boat and watch Disney movies? Whatever, man. Sam storms off. Outside, Sam sees Ryan and decides to vent to her. He tells her, we should be talking about rationing. We don't even know all the supplies we have on hand. And everyone is eating eggs like we have an infinite supply. But I haven't seen any chickens, have you? Ryan tells Sam, Look, Rick just thinks Walter wouldn't let us starve. Sam can't believe what he's hearing, and he, he walks off for the day and explores. Sam, he walks around and heads into the forest. And he walks until he touches the invisible wall that seems to be keeping them in. He touches the wall and it kind of stings when he touches it. Sam, he then walks along the invisible wall with a twig, with the twig touching the invisible wall. Walter is watching this. He's watching Sam. While Sam is walking, Rick and the others are out on the lake, enjoying their day on the boat. Sam returns home that night to the lake house, and he is eager to go to sleep and start out again tomorrow. He is going to bring supplies and try to stay out there for a while and really figure things out. The next day, Sam gets up early to investigate some more. He argues with his boyfriend, Arturo, about the seriousness of the situation they are in. Sam thinks Arturo is being too casual. Sam explains the reason that he is not calm. He tells Arturo, I'm not calm because we're in a prison. It's a nice prison, but we're still freaking stuck here, and I will not just sit back and watch movies and have dinners and fuck around like it's not the end of the world out there. There are answers out there, not in that frickin' house. It might take me a few days. I have food. I have your boots. I found a flare gun in the garage. I'll shoot it off if I get into trouble. Arturo offers to go with Sam, but Sam rejects that and he leaves. Sam, he gets out and explores. He takes notes and pictures he is trying to figure out what the hell is the deal with everything. Sam eventually, through all of his exploring, finds a black structure. He does not know what the deal with it is. It looks like a big black house, except it has no entrance. There are also a bunch of weird statues around it, too. Sam, he starts screaming, trying to talk to Walter. He says, what is all this, man? I know you're in there. Answer me, Walter. You pushed me so hard to come here. Why? 
Why would you ever think I could live like this? I should be dead out there like everyone else. I didn't ask for this. I didn't want this. Why did you even invite me? Sam, tired now, giving up, fires off the flare gun into the air. He eventually composes himself and starts walking back home. On the other side of that black structure, though, it turns out someone was inside there, not Walter. It was another friend of Walter's from high school named Reginald. Sam even knows Reginald. Reginald Madison, the painter. Reginald, too, was invited. But for some reason, Reginald was kept in this other place. Reginald can see Sam on the other side of this black structure. And Reginald starts yelling, saying, Sam, Sam, can you hear me? It's Reg. I'm right here. Can you hear me? Sam cannot hear him, though. Sam, he continues walking on, and eventually he gets picked up by boat by Arturo and David. Arturo was watching for Sam's flare gun to go in the air, and when he saw it, he came by to pick Sam up. Arturo asks if Sam found what he was looking for, and Sam answers, I found all I was going to find. Now let's go home. Issue 4 We learn from David Day, the comedian narrating to us, that they were worried in the house about starving to death. After a few days of panic, though, the first box arrived, full of fresh food, and it had a notepad. It took them all another day to realize that whatever they all wrote on that notepad showed up in front of the house the next morning. And another week later, they learned that they could request things privately if they took a page out of the notepad to their room and wrote their name on it. We see some example scribbles of things they requested. For example, on day 8, they wrote, Testing, 1, 2, 3, 1, apple. And the next day, an apple arrived. Day 9, 10 chicken breast, 1 pound of butter, 2 bags of mixed greens, 1 box of chicken ramen, and one pack of National Spirit Blue Cigarettes. Day 11. A lot of weed gummies, one tub of peanut butter pretzel bites, one carton of National Spirit Blue Cigarettes, one dozen bagels, cream cheese, etc, etc, etc. As the days went on, everyone in the house started ordering more elaborate things. They began to nickname this sort of magical delivery service as Alien Amazon. And we jump to day 27 now, and we see all of the crazy shit that David Day has requested down in the movie theater room. We see a monkey in a spacesuit, the very first issue of Action Comics, an arcade machine, a couple of Oscars, and tons more. David, he starts wandering around. He goes down to the library and he sees Nora and Sarah reading books. They all talk a bit. David asks them, how did they arrive here at the house on the lake? Was it by car or by the airport or whatnot? They don't really remember. Molly comes down and asks David if he checked the packages yet. Was there something specifically for her or something she ordered that she is waiting for? David tells her nothing came for her today. David, he then talks to himself about maybe ordering a cowboy hat, like a, like a really nice one. Day 28. David sees Ryan sleeping outside. Ryan was trying to stay awake so she could see and watch the magical packages being delivered. But she fell asleep and then the packages were beside her when she woke up. David tells her, Ryan, we tried this all. The boxes don't come if anybody is looking. Ryan explains, no, nah, I, I guess I was just kind of hoping for some kind of proof of the boxes being delivered here, like truck treads on the ground or something. That might mean there was some warehouse of people out there. David, he gets his stupid cowboy hat, and it's like zebra printed. <laughs> David, he brings the packages inside for the others in the house. David announces, the great alien bounty has arrived. Naya, who is cooking in the kitchen food for everybody, thanks David. She says that she might order up some food for a big meal she is planning tomorrow. David asks Nea, hey, question, you and Rick, did you drive in from New York or did you fly into Madison? 
Naya answers, hmm, we must have flown. I hate long drives. Molly asks David again, did a package arrive for her today? And David tells her, no, sorry. Day 29. David, on this day, is once again delivering the alien packages from Walter to whoever ordered anything within the house. David gets to Molly and Veronica's room. Molly and Veronica are good friends, so they share a bedroom. Veronica asks if Molly got a package today, and David tells her, no, not today. Veronica tells Molly, sorry, dear, no luck. Veronica then goes into the hall and wants to talk to David in private where Molly can't hear. Veronica tells David that she is worried about Molly. Molly's not doing so hot. I only see her when it's time to pass out the mail. I don't remember the last time I even saw her eating. I'm worried what she might do if I leave her alone too long, if I'm honest. David, concerned, asks her, Is that bad, huh? Veronica says, yeah. Now give me my alien presents. I want to look at them. <laughs> Day 30. David, he is delivering everyone's packages once again. He goes to Sam and Arturo's room, but Arturo tells David that Sam is down by the lake. Molly once again asks David if she has a package today, and David tells Molly nothing again today. Molly then breaks down and says, He's just not going to let me do it, is he? He's really not going to. <sighs> I'm sorry. David... He offers to help Molly. He wonders if maybe she is ordering wrong. He tells her, maybe you're ordering wrong or something. Do you want me to look at how you're doing it? I've been going really specific with mine, like the exact brand I want and everything. Molly replies, do you really want to know? Here, I already wrote down what I want for tomorrow. We see some examples of things that David have ordered, and they're all pretty random funny shit. A suit covered in exclamation points, a suit covered in question marks, the three most expensive watches money can buy, the three most expensive bottles of liquor money can buy, the three most expensive Fabergé eggs money can buy, the three most- okay, you get it. <laughs> he wanted every Academy Award won by the Lord of the Rings trilogy, every kind of Oculus VR headset, so he can see which one he likes best. He wanted a weighted blanket one day, and then the next day he wanted a lighter weighted blanket. He wanted the first appearance of Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman in comics. And he wanted another bottle of the most expensive liquor money can buy. And he wanted a flashlight. And he wrote, don't judge me, bro. What did Molly try to order, though? Molly tried to order her husband. On day eight, she wrote Cam. Day nine, Cameron. Day 10, Cameron Michael Reynolds. Day 11, Cameron Michael Reynolds. Underlined. Day 12. My husband, underlined, Cameron Michael Reynolds. Day 13, my husband, Cameron Michael Reynolds, alive. Day 14, Cameron, my mom, and my dad, alive. Day 15, give me my fucking husband back, Walter. Once that didn't work, she wrote down stuff to try and kill herself with. Day 21, handgun and bullets. 22, enough rope. 23, straight razor, 24, straight razor, 25, straight razor, straight razor, straight razor, straight razor, straight razor. Walter, he hasn't been delivering Molly these because he can't give her her husband and he doesn't want her to try to kill herself. David, he decides that night to write down a straight razor for himself and see if he can get it delivered for Molly. Day 31, David goes outside to pick up the packages today. He sees Walter there, watching him. Walter probably knows that David ordered the straight razor for Molly. David tells Walter, You know, you could have just told us the rules, man. David goes back inside. He heads over to Molly's door, and he tells her, I have a package for you. Molly, looking at the package, says, That isn't my symbol, it's your symbol. David tells her, Yeah, but it's still for you. Molly opens the package and sees it is a razor. David tells her, look, I've been thinking, and I think you're looking for permission. You could have just gone to the lake or something otherwise to end it, so you put it in Walter's hands. I know you're hurting and you want it to stop. I think it's natural. Veronica, she isn't going to tell you that because she's scared of losing you, but I want to tell you that everything you are feeling is natural, and wanting a way out is a natural choice. But... 
There's nothing natural about this place, and Walter isn't going to give any of us the permission you're looking for. And that should make you so freaking angry that it makes you want to stick it out just to help us figure out how to stick it to him. I want to show you something that I figured out last night, but I'm going to need that straight razor in order to do it. Later on that day, it is night time and they are all having a big family dinner that Naya prepared for everyone all day. David and Molly arrive a little bit late to the dinner and David, he is bleeding, has blood all over him. David, he stands on the table and he is holding the razor blade to his throat and he tells the group, so I think there's a couple things we should talk about. Nobody remembers how they got here. You all kind of just brush it off when I asked you. And sure, there's a lot going on and airports are boring and whatnot, but myself, I remember packing for the trip in my apartment in New York, and then I remember getting to the house. I don't remember anything in between those two things. Nora and Sarah, they know something that the rest of us don't know, and they're being really weird about it. And Sam... He found a weird building on the other side of the lake back in the first week, but didn't tell anybody about it. I know this all freaking sucks, and it's not like we all know each other really well. Some of us were really tight a while ago, but as a group, we don't know each other at all. And we're all just kind of slipping into ourselves, and we're waiting for this all to be over. But we have to love each other, and look after each other, or there's no hope of us surviving all of this. We all know, Walter, there is no getting off this ride. The group is telling David to stop. This isn't funny. They see him holding the razor blade and they don't want him to do anything rash. David, he's holding the blade to his neck and he slits his throat open. And then he tells the group, we can't die. He won't let us. So we have to learn how to live. Issue 5 Back in issue 3, we learned there was a guy named Reginald Madison, the painter, who is trapped in the black building near the lake. Reginald is going to be important this issue. Veronica the scientist, she is narrating to us, talking to us, the reader, and she brings us to a flashback when she and various others were in high school. Veronica was dating Nora, or Norm, back then and they were hanging out with Walter and Reginald. Reginald and Norm went into another room to talk, and Walter and Veronica were alone. Walter back then, he started hinting to Veronica about some of his weird alien responsibilities. He told Veronica, I, I don't know, I didn't think I'd like so many of you, people. I thought choosing was going to be easy, but... I only have so many spaces to fill and I have an important responsibility. Veronica did not really understand what Walter was talking about. So Walter decided to show her. He tells her that she is so smart and she might fit the criteria better than Norm or Reginald. Walter transformed and showed Veronica his more alien, crazy looking form. And Veronica back then, she just started freaking out. Walter, he decided to bail on that after he saw Veronica's reaction, realizing she couldn't handle it. Walter reverted back to his normal-looking human form and told her, forget. And Veronica forgot everything, and she snapped back to normal. And she just said, oh, uh, I'm sorry. I don't know what just happened. I had like a brain fart. Why did I stand up? And Walter told her, it's okay. And then, then the two of them just talked about the stars for the rest of the night. Veronica narrates now to us that she didn't remember any of that. She didn't know why Walter was being weird back then. She explains how, though, Reginald always seemed to understand Walter on a deeper level. He was the one that always seemed to guide Walter to decisions. Back to the current day where we left off last issue. Reginald seems to be reading a transcript of events that have happened. He is reading about when David slit his throat last issue, and David showed the group that they can't die. He tells them that they all have healing factors. The group then theorized on 
What are the rules for this place, this lake house? Why can't Walter tell them all of the rules? Veronica then tells the group that they should all sleep on it. And tomorrow in the morning, they should all sit down and really try to break everything down and share all the information that everyone has on this place. They break for the night. Rick he goes out and walks into the forest alone. Ryan, thinking it a little bit odd, follows Rick silently eavesdropping. Rick he is in the forest now, and he tries to communicate to Walter. He says, I don't understand. Am I supposed to stop them from putting this stuff together, or is this what you want? Walter, please, are you out there? Can you hear me? The next day in the morning, Veronica, the scientist, has a big whiteboard. And the group together, they brainstormed all sorts of information that they have discovered, as well as questions or theories they have. So, what are the features of this lake house area? There's an invisible wall, it's a hexagon, it stings to touch, is it like a force field? There's weird statues, they show you the apocalypse, do the other statues show different things? What is the statue's purpose? What is the deal with this mail order system? Where do the items come from? Is it alien made replicas of stuff? Is it stuff recovered from the real world? Why are there birds and animals on the property? Are they real? Can they be hunted or farmed? Are there like fish in the lake? Where are they? Nobody remembers traveling to Wisconsin. Why are there mountains in the distance? There's no mountains in Wisconsin. What are the possibilities? They're walled off, but are they on Earth or are they on a spaceship? Or are they in another dimension? Is it a hollow Earth? No, probably not. Walter, is he an alien? Is he an interdimensional being? Is he ultra-terrestrial? Just a made-up word that David said. Is he a hologram body? Is he a flesh tornado? How old is he? Was there ever a real human, Walter? Why would an alien have to go to high school or college? Why did he take us? Nora and Sarah, they show the group the guns and weapons they found. David, he thinks they are really cool. He comments, We can't get killed, remember? I could shoot you all in the head right now and we'd all be fine. Veronica comments that they should take the gun away from David. Sam tells the group all about the mysterious black house with no entrance he found a few weeks ago. The group eventually decide to go check out this black house all together. So they all get into the boat and they drive over to where this house is. On the boat ride over, Veronica, the scientist, explains something she noticed a while ago but didn't mention before. She knows a lot about stars and she says that you can actually tell time by using the stars and looking at their position in the sky. But for some reason here, the stars haven't moved. The group asks Sir, so what does that mean? And Veronica answers, I have no idea. The group of 10 of them arrive at the black house. There are all sorts of weird symbols around them. They investigate it and they can't figure out how to get into the black house. So they decide to shoot at the house. That does nothing though. They then decide to blow up the house with the explosives they brought from their own house. They set up the explosives and they blow it up, but the house is still standing unharmed. They then look around. Ryan notices that all of these weird statues around them each have a symbol on it with one of their logos. She wonders, what if everyone touched their own logo at the same time? They decide to try it out, and then something starts happening. The black house opens, and inside is this Reginald Madison, the painter. Reginald says to the group, <laughs> About time, you guys! It's good to see people again, real human people. Reginald goes over and hugs Nora, as they are old friends. Reginald then tells the group, Apologies if I'm a little manic. I've been practicing speeches in my head since before you all got here. I really thought you were going to put this all together much faster. We're going to have to work very quickly now. There's still time to save the world. Issue 6 It starts raining and lightning is coming down from the sky. Reginald invites all of the members of the nice house on the lake into the black building he was staying in. Molly asks, what did Reginald mean when he said that they could still save the world? Reginald explains that they are part of an experiment, and he doesn't think that the experiment is working. 
Not how they want. So they might still have some time. Veronica asks, who is they? Reginald answers, the aliens, Walter's family, whatever the hell they are. Reginald says that he has been getting and reading transcripts of everything that has been going on with the others since they arrived. He then goes into a whole breakdown explaining his history with Walter. We have a flashback back to the high school days. Walter, Nora, or Norm, and Reginald were all best friends, the three of them. Walter wanted to tell them all his big secret. Walter was really nervous about it, and he kind of prepped them for it for a few weeks. But it finally came time to reveal everything. One weekend, they all got together for like a slumber party, and Walter told them what the deal was. Walter said, the world is going to end soon. Not immediately or anything, there will still be another couple decades, but they're not going to be good. We've been doing what we can to make sure that you can't really fight back. The world is going to get ugly. People are going to hurt each other because most people aren't very good. We didn't even need to put our finger on the scale that hard, but it's going to get much worse. And then it's going to come to an end. And I'm supposed to save, like, the best of the best. The people who are the best examples of your species from a number of fields. Exceptional humans. They put me in school and gave me a body and hormones and all of these human feelings so I could make my choice in a more educated way. I'll make my choice and I'll put them in a nice place they can live in for the rest of time so we can keep studying your kind. And once I prove that my group is a stable sample of the human population, then we'll exterminate the rest of you. Nora, as Norm back then, asked, So, you're an alien or something? Or like, one of those agents from the Matrix? Walter answered, I'm just... something else. It's hard to describe. You don't really have words for it. Nora grows angry, telling Walter, Yeah, well, shut up or prove it, okay? Walter, he proves it. He transforms into his creepy alien kind of appearance. And Nora starts freaking the hell out. Nora says, What the hell? What the hell, man? What the hell is happening? Wait, this is real? You're gonna blow up the freaking world? You're gonna kill us? I... I won't let you! I can't! Walter tells Nora to forget. And Nora forgot. Clearly did not react well to Walter's surprise information. Reginald, though, he seemed more cool with it. He asked Walter then, You want to save us? You want us to be in your sample set because you love us? Walter answered, Yeah, but I need you to be exceptional so my superior so they don't take you away from me. Reginald asked, You're gonna make me forget too, aren't you? Walter answered, Yeah, but I was thinking maybe we could talk sometimes. Maybe I could ask you your advice. Will you help me? And Reginald said, Yeah, okay. Reginald, now in the current day, back in this black house with the others, says that he helped Walter. He helped design all of this, this lake house. This whole ordered system. This is what he's been doing for years. Molly asks, why didn't he tell someone? Reginald explains, every time after I talked to Walter, he'd take the memory away. I didn't know. There wasn't any way to push back. They ask Reginald, why does he still think there is hope in the world? Reginald answers, well, it's an experiment. It's always been an experiment. They need us to be a stable group together, and we're not. We're already screwing with the order of things. That says to me that this is a trial run. It says to me the rest of the world is probably still out there. I know how this place works, I know its rules, and if we work together, we can- Walter then walks into the room. He tells them all, you have to stop this. Stop trying to break the system here. It's not going to get you what you want. Please, trust me, I'm doing all of this for you. Please, you have to relax. You have to enjoy yourselves. Put all of this out of your heads. There is nothing good at the end of this road. 
Nora yells at Walter, What else have you been hiding, Walter? What else did you take from our memories? Walter, he lets out a big sigh. <sighs> and then he says, Forget. Walter, he altered the entire group's memories. He's going to rejigger things and try some more. They are all back in the lake house. The next thing we notice, Ryan Kane, the artist, wakes up in bed. She's in a room with Reginald, and Reginald is painting. Walter then walks into the room, looking normal. No one remembers that Walter was this weird alien figure. Walter tells Ryan and Reginald, Hey guys, I think Rick and I are going to go on this hike this afternoon, try and map a bit more of the hexagon, see if there are any more weird buildings here. Reginald answers back, Y'all have fun? Miss Ryan and I are having a detox and painting kind of day. Walter and Rick leave. Ryan, looking out the window, comments, Looks like it's going to be a nice day today. Reginald replies, Yeah, yeah, it does. And with that cliffhanger, we end Volume 1. All right, so that was The Nice House on the Lake, Volume 1. Let me go through my thoughts on this one. I thought the artwork was pretty cool, although sometimes I have a little bit of trouble telling which character is who. But still, I thought it was pretty solid. And I also kind of liked the way they told the story through things like um, text messages and, and scripts and emails and lists of things that people wanted. So I thought all that was pretty clever. Now, I really love the concept of this book, and I just like to put myself in the shoes of these characters and think, what would I do if I was there with them? Would I be like Sam, really trying to figure everything out? Would I be like Rick and just try to get everyone to accept this? Would I be like David and just kind of dick around and order random shit that I thought was cool, like really expensive watches and uh, comic books and whatnot? So I thought all that was really fun, just putting yourself in this world with these characters and thinking, you know, how would you deal with it all? I'm really curious with the mystery of everything and where the story is going to go from here. How is it going to end? Is the Earth really destroyed? Or is this testing process really going to end in a different kind of way? Oh, man. There's so many things in this book that are just so clever and neat. And uh, yeah. Great stuff. I'm going to give this one a 9 out of 10. I'm absolutely hooked in the story. Want to know how it's going to end. When this book finishes, I think I will return to it and wrap up the story. So uh, look for my Volume 2 video on this in a few months, whenever that does wrap up. And next week, I will be back with Ice Cream Man, uh, Volume 3 and 4. I really liked Ice Cream Man, so I wanted to do a little bit more of that. So I will be back with Ice Cream Man next week. 